from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, a judge throws out a critical California law backed by the biggest gig economy companies. Prop 22 allowed Uber, Lyft, Instacart, and DoorDash to classify their workers as contractors instead of employees with full-time benefits. Now it's been ruled unconstitutional. We'll break down what it all means. Plus, it's not just SpaceX. There's a whole host of companies vying for the space launch market. One of them is Firefly, with its first launch on deck in just two weeks. We'll ask the CEO what he has on Elon Musk. And Disney racks up $125 million in online revenue from Black Widow. Actress Scarlett Johansson has already sued the company, saying Disney cheated her out of a big payout by releasing the film online and in theaters. We'll find out how this helps or hurts her case. We'll get to that in a moment, but first, the market started the week in the green. Optimism over vaccines, of course. Let's get the details with our own Ed Ludlow. Ed, take it away. Yeah, stocks near record highs. The S&P 500 up by nine tenths of a percent. As I said, near record highs. Really, the gains were in technology stocks. You can see the Nasdaq 100, very tech heavy index, at a fresh record high, up one and a half percent, outperforming. Nice sea of green. We like to see that on a Monday. A lot of this around optimism about vaccines really driving a recovery for the U.S. economy. Of course, it's a big week, though. Come with me into my Bloomberg terminal. Take a look at this chart. You can see the S&P 500 really been making gains as the Fed continues to add to its balance sheet with those asset purchases. Of course, we had the Jackson Hole Symposium this week. The feeling is that we'll get some kind of mood music at least about the outlook for tapering. But as I said, come back to me in the studio. The other big story of the week is is this landmark U.S. regulator full approval for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. You had President Biden speaking on Monday saying that this may spur mandates from employers to get their employees vaccinated. You can see the gains in Pfizer up 2.5%. BioNTech's American depository receipts up almost 10% with those outside games. The other big story you're following, of course, is the decision by California court to throw out that ballot decision that people voted to treat gig economy workers as contractors. Interesting, what we saw was initially Monday a drop in those stocks. Uber, Lyft, DoorDash were all down. Well, by close of play on Monday, you can see Uber up more than 2.5%, Lyft up almost 3%. It was really just DoorDash that struggled to negate those losses, still down half a percent. Wall Street essentially saying that they expected some short-term losses, some, some volatility, some pressure, but really this isn't going to move the needle much. Emily. Interesting, Ed. Well, we're going to talk about that much more. Ed Ludlow, thanks so much. Stick with us. The hotly debated California law that voters passed overwhelmingly last November has been ruled unconstitutional. Gig economy companies, again, Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, paid heavily to market this law, Prop 22, to voters. It allows the companies to classify drivers as contractors rather than full-time employees with full-time benefits that come with that. Now a state judge has said this law is unenforceable. What does it mean for their drivers and for their business models? Bloomberg's Josh Idelson and Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence join us now for more. So Josh, this came out late on a Friday, as I understand was pretty unexpected. How much of a surprise was this? This was a big Friday night surprise for a lot of people who had seen this lawsuit as a long shot, this challenge by some rideshare drivers and union organizers to overturn the law. But the state judge sided with these challengers, saying that the proposition is unconstitutional, in particular, crucially, because it contradicts the authority that the state legislature has under the Constitution to govern the state's workers' compensation system. Prop 22 deemed these workers to be contractors and not employees, and thus excluded them from a suite of state workplace protections, including workers' comp, this judge said the ballot measure, which was not a constitutional amendment, went too far in disrupting the rights that the Constitution specifies the legislature has to govern the workers' compensation system. 
Uh, the law, uh, this, 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 this particular case was pushed uh, by drivers themselves and also an organization called the SEIU, uh, California State Council. Uh, spokesperson for that organization said for two years, drivers have been saying that democracy cannot be bought. And today's decision shows they were right. Uh, Uber responded, spokesperson Noah Edwardson saying, this ruling ignores the will of the overwhelming majority of California voters and defies both logic and the law. We will appeal and we expect to win. Now, Uber uh, CEO Dara Khosrowshahi, whenever I've spoken to him, uh, has said repeatedly that drivers want more flexibility, that being a contractor provides. They have provided additional benefits for the drivers as contractors. Mandeep, what's your take on how this impacts the long term and the short term sustainability of their business model that depends on this structure? Absolutely. And I think what we have seen with these companies is obviously their variable costs are very high because they have to, you know, keep incentivizing to bring drivers to the platform. Now it kind of puts into question, what is the business model? Can they keep a certain set of drivers, you know, to operate on the platform? And do they have to give benefits? So that could add to the fixed costs. We knew variable costs were high for these companies. Guess what? I think the more they have to pay in terms of benefits, that would add to the fixed costs. And for a company of Uber size that's, you know, $15 billion in annual revenue, still not profitable, that just kind of uh, puts a lot of question marks around their sustainability of the business. You know, what, what does it mean to keep this business profitable for the long term, given we don't even know what their, uh, you know, operating structure is going to be uh, a few months down the line. Now, a judge says the law is unenforceable. Josh, Uber says the law is still in effect. Which is it? Is it in effect or not? What does this mean for drivers on the roads at this very moment? Well, procedurally, first, the judge needs to issue an order that matches what he has said in the ruling is his conclusion. Once that happens, it is certain there will be an appeal. And then we have reason to expect that the ruling could be put on hold in taking effect while the higher court and then potentially the state Supreme Court reach their own conclusion. There's no reason to assume that what happened Friday will or won't be the ultimate outcome here. but. It all depends on the legal struggle that will now take place over the next several months as the companies struggle to convince higher judges that this judge got it wrong. Well, and the companies are battling efforts like this in other states as well. For example, Massachusetts. Also, there are discussions going on in New York. Josh, what do you see as the longer term um, outcome here, given that this is such a critical part of how these companies operate? Yeah, these companies are in a global struggle and have been for years increasingly over the legality of their business model, which rests on the claim that these workers are contractors and not employees with full workplace rights. Prop 22 was a huge deal, not just because of how it shields the companies from legal liability in California, but also as a political victory at a time when at the federal level in the United States, Democrats are in control and have the potential through legislation and enforcement and regulation to come after these companies' business model. The companies are trying to export something like Prop 22 via ballot measure in Massachusetts, via talks that they've engaged with to try to reach a compromise in other places like New York. And so for the moment, Prop 22 is in place, but it has an asterisk on it. And what happens to that ballot measure is significant in terms of this much larger wrangling in the United States. Because while the state can't trump federal law, what happens in these states and whether the companies can establish a model that's more to their liking there will help shape the national debate about this issue. So, Mandeep, what does this mean for riders? I mean, one interpretation is that riders and, you know, people ordering food face higher ride costs, higher food delivery costs. Will this get passed on to us? I mean, it's very likely, you know, uh, they have pressure from investors to show profitability. And that's what they have done, you know, with even uh, the surge in pricing. They have passed on all the costs. I think the only silver lining I see for these companies at this point of time is, guess what? You're not going to have new competitors enter this market. 
One thing is very certain that this is a hard business, you know, to operate. I mean, both food delivery, ride sharing. Ride sharing was showing signs of profitability, but this whole thing, you know, the judgment kind of puts into question the long-term viability of ride sharing. And so you're not going to see new entrants. Even today, I think DD said they're not going to enter the Europe market, the UK market. And that is a sign that you're not going to get new competition. And that, I think, could be, uh, you know, uh, positive for the likes of Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash, who are the incumbents here now. All right. Well, certainly something we're going to continue to follow. Uh, Bloomberg's Josh Idelson. I know you'll be following the case every step of the way. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. Thanks so much. Okay, coming up, Bitcoin briefly tops that $50,000 mark for the first time since May, recovering from a very disorderly plunge three months ago. Will it last? We'll talk about that next. This is Bloomberg. Bitcoin has gone over $50,000 for the first time since mid-May. The world's largest digital coin now up 72% since the July low. The value of the total crypto market has risen almost a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars in just the last month. Aya Kantorovic of Falcon X with us now. So Aya, this march to $50,000, is this sustainable or is this just a blip? Hey, Emily, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, great question. It is very much sustainable. I think, you know, what we've been seeing over the last couple of weeks is this crawl towards this 50K mark. This was very much a psychological price point uh, for us to get to. And not just that, Ethereum inching closer to 3.5K as well. Uh, one thing that's very different here in terms of uh, the price rise up here versus April, as you mentioned uh, before in the recent three-month all-time high, is really what accelerated uh, the price rally. Here in this last weekend, we saw a lot of at-the-money uh, call option buyers come in and accelerate that price point beyond the 50K. What we were seeing in April and we're not necessarily seeing uh, today is leverage. And so you're not seeing as much of these uh, levered longs, uh, as well as uh, you know, funding rates are marginally positive. You're seeing GPTC is still at a discount and you're seeing uh, levered call option demand uh, still at lows. And so really, I think the narrative here is that there were few notional wallets uh, that, you know, were able to move this price point beyond that psychological 50K point. Uh, that being said, uh, if you look at uh, what I consider just the, the major statistic is really the cryptocurrency dominance. If you look at Bitcoin dominance, you compare it to Ethereum dominance, Bitcoin at lows of 40%, Ethereum nearing highs of 20%. Uh, really, that narrative is reflected across the institutional investor that we see today. And, and that's really this excitement across Ethereum and across you know uh, protocols where there's measurable cash flows. And so, okay. you know, it's very much, you know, this diversification across these different protocols. Now, you were in institutional coverage. What are the risks to the current run? What could derail this, given the drip dropping, for example, of regulatory signals we're getting from the SEC? Yeah, that's a great question. Listen, at, at the end of the day, institutional investors want uh, clarity around uh, cryptocurrency. And so, you know, regulation is very much top of mind. As you had mentioned, I think uh, previously last week, Gary Gensler uh, and his statements around DeFi, this is something that we're all excited to see uh, what direction the SEC goes in. And, you know, we're, we're going to work together with that and those uh, requirements. Um, and I think it's exciting for institutional investors. Again, there's a lot of people who still cannot access this space because there is regulatory unclarity. And so that'll open up a much larger use case uh, and players into the space. Now, there's a lot of debate happening within the crypto community, Bitcoin versus Ethereum, Bitcoin maximalism. Gary Tan, one of the original investors in Coinbase, got into some trouble for some things he said on our show, which the maximalists didn't like. Take a listen to what he had to say. Probably better to be agnostic. The reality is it's 
up to the software engineers and the creators to actually create platforms that enable things that are actually usable. And for me, it's just, I, I can't look at DeFi, I can't look at NFTs, and I frankly can't look at the stream of really smart software engineers who come into our offices every day and say that, you know, Ethereum isn't the platform to sort of focus on and to beat right now. He got a lot of flack on Twitter there for saying folks should be agnostic rather than partial to either or. What do you think? Is it Bitcoin or bust or no? Let's take it one step further. Let's diversify outside of just Bitcoin and Ethereum. To be honest, I agree with Gary, but I'll take it one step further. You know, today, in the same way in traditional world, you wouldn't just invest in Google for search, in the same way Facebook for social, and YouTube for video. You would get a diversified portfolio across those three. And similarly, what we're seeing is that NFTs will use a different blockchain than Ethereum. And some lending and borrowing platforms or derivatives will use a different blockchain than Ethereum. I think the other thing too is especially following the Ethereum hard fork, uh, London uh, EIP 1559, and the uncertainty around this transition from proof of work to proof of stake that should be happening in the next year. Institutional investors are looking for a way to diversify uh, and hedge against that uncertainty. And so what we're seeing, at least, especially in the last couple of weeks, is these uh, comparable uh, Ethereum-like alternatives. These are layer ones that include Solana, they include Terra uh, and the Luna ecosystem, they include Cosmos, Near, Avalanche on Polkadot, as well as a, a number of others, in addition to you know, all of the, the interest around NFTs and the metaverse. All right, uh, well, uh, I will pass your feedback on to Gary and the Twitter sphere uh, crypto community, Aya Kadorovich <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> Falcon X. Thank you so much um, for, for joining us there um, and um, putting a stake in the ground. Okay, in other crypto news, Visa has bought a digital avatar for $150,000 in a show of support for the burgeoning area of NFT investing. Titled CryptoPunk7610, the avatar is a female character with a mohawk, clown green eyes, and red lip color. The payments network is one of several financial institutions in the last year to lend legitimacy to the crypto world. Back in March, the company said it would experiment with using a type of cryptocurrency to settle transactions. And coming up, the COVID-19 vaccine made by Pfizer and BioNTech wins full approval from U.S. regulators. We're going to look at how this could help stop the spread of Delta next. Plus, the tech earnings continue this week. Wednesday, we're going to get a quarterly report from Salesforce now that the acquisition of Slack is a done deal. Thursday, a gauge of the PC market with HP Inc. and Dell. Peloton's numbers also out Thursday. Expect to hear how the company hopes to sustain growth despite setbacks from a safety recall. And of course, we'll bring you all the details and analysis across them all. This is Bloomberg. President Biden says full approval of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine should clear the way for companies to impose vaccine requirements for employees. The president spoke after the U.S. FDA granted approval for the vaccine for ages 16 and up. So far, the shots have been allowed under just emergency authorization. It is the first COVID vaccine to be fully cleared by U.S. regulators. Today, I'm calling on more country, more companies, I should say, in the private sector to step up with vaccine requirements that will reach millions more people. Joining us now for more, Bloomberg's Emma Court, who's been covering this major development. Emma, what does this mean for businesses? Are, you, are we already seeing businesses step up and start these mandates now that this vaccine is fully authorized? Yeah, there's a lot of expectation that this is going to be kind of a key moment in terms of businesses feeling empowered to require um, COVID-19 vaccines for their workforce. We've already started seeing that coming out of the government, out of some other places. And I think there's a real expectation that's going to intensify, you know, even in, in the coming days. Um, you know, there has been some hesitation around this vaccine, these vaccines being 
you know, only emergency authorized the idea being there's some gray area around whether you can really require this for people. Um, and that should kind of be start getting cleared away with this first approval today. Now, there also seems to be a gray area around boosters. You know, I know that uh, they've given this guidance of eight months from your second shot. A lot of folks wondering, should I get it sooner? Many people taking matters into their own hands, getting it sooner anyway. What are you seeing here? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think, you know, we've already seen people starting to take this into their own hands. You know, even before the guidance for people who are immunocompromised came out the other week, you know, some people were saying, I need to protect myself. And it wasn't just immunocompromised folks. Um, you know, the, the real question here is kind of when is the right time to do this? And what we've heard from government authorities is that they chose this eight month kind of time frame after your second shot based on what they were seeing and based on the science. And, you know, it may well vary a little bit, but this is kind of, this is the best guidance that we've got right now. So what's the timeline for the next full authorization? Obviously, I assume we're expecting Moderna to be on deck. Yeah, so that's a really great question. And, and the short answer is we don't totally know. Um, Moderna is still submitting its authorization, uh, its application. Um, we know that Pfizer submitted its application in, in the May timeframe. So that was a couple of months ago. Um, and these things usually can take about eight, eight months for the FDA to make a decision on. So, you know, it, it is going to take some time. But I know everyone's really looking towards the sort of Moderna and Johnson & Johnson uh, decisions here ne you know, next. So what are you focusing on, you know, at this moment, given that we have this full authorization, do we expect this to encourage or convince folks who haven't gotten the vaccine yet to get out the door and get their shots? Yeah, this is a really essential question. And, you know, I think there's a lot of hope that this will get people who haven't gotten vaccinated. Nearly 30 percent of Americans, as, as we all know, you know, haven't had even one shot yet. Um, and you do hear very frequently among this unvaccinated population this idea that this vaccine, these vaccines are not approved. They haven't been held up to this sort of stringent you know, government regulatory standard. And now that that's starting to get cleared away and we have at least one vaccine that's been approved, it, it remains to be seen how compelling that is. And I think, you know, some people I've talked to who remain unvaccinated have cited this emergency use authorization as an objection they have. But when I've said, you know, let's say that the Pfizer vaccine gets approved, you know, in the coming weeks, does that change things for you? Do you go get the Pfizer vaccine? And invariably, they've said no. So I think okay. there is some reason to be skeptical about how much this changes the game. And I think, you know, based on the fact that the, fa that the FDA really rushed to kind of get this approval and really rushed to re do the review, you may start seeing this new okay. time frame of, you know, well, what about this quick approval? How do we know this is legitimate? And, and I think that's probably going to be the next kind All of right. new wave of arguments. Bloomberg's Emma Court. Uh, so much to continue to keep track of. Thanks so much. Coming up, take it on SpaceX in the commercial space race. I'm going to speak with Tom Markusik, CEO and co-founder of Firefly Aerospace, as his company prepares to launch its Alpha rocket for the first time. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's get back to the markets where it's another day, another SPAC. This time, a familiar name. Richard Branson's other space company, Virgin Orbit, has agreed to go public through a reverse merger with a special purpose acquisition company. Our Ed Ludlow here with the details. Ed, what can you tell us? Yeah, so he's like really committed to the SPAC model, right? This is Virgin Orbit, the small sat launch provider, as opposed to Virgin Galactic, which carries people. Really interesting deal. Valuation of $3.2 billion with Next Gen Acquisition Corp, generating almost $500 million for the company to spend, to invest, to grow should be done by the end of this year, ticker VORB. When you get SPAC deals and outside like this, sometimes you see a big pop. Let's bring up the shares of NextGen. And what we saw was actually pretty modest gain, up around 2% after treading water for many of the last sessions. This is not your typical rocketry, Emily. Let's take a look at the video. What this is is very similar to Virgin Galactic. Virgin Orbit sent its rocket up on the fuselage, you see there, of a Boeing 747, a custom Boeing 747, around 35,000 feet, 
the rocket detaches, drops off the bottom like you see there, ignites and makes the way, the rest of its way into low Earth orbit on a kind of similar arc to what you see from that Virgin Galactic spaceship, which carries people. So I thought that was really interesting. Custom Boeing 747. So it's really interesting, if you come back to me in the studio, to look at some of the key investors here on this deal, especially those that participated in the pipe or private investment in public equity, because Boeing is part of that, plowing money into this. Of course, Boeing has its own launch activities using standard rocketry, but I thought it's really interesting they've been involved with this deal. So we will have two Virgin branded, two Richard Branson backed public companies, as long as all goes well, by the end of this year. Astonishing. All right, Ed, thanks so much. A very crowded launch space market. We're going to talk about that a little more now. For more insight on the commercial space race, how it's playing out, let's speak with another launch provider, Tom Markusik, Firefly Aerospace CEO, co-founder, and CTO. Firefly is aiming to serve the growing small satellite launch market. So, Tom, talk to us about how Firefly compares to a SpaceX, to Virgin Orbit, to Rocket Lab, the other players out there. Yes, thanks, Emory. Thanks for having me. I'm talking to you here from the National Space Symposium today, where a lot of the new entrants and, and some of the uh, heritage companies are here today. So how do we compare to SpaceX and the others? You know, I would characterize SpaceX as a first-generation new space company that's really trying to find new ways to get to space more efficiently and at a lower cost. Firefly and some of these other companies you mentioned are second-generation companies. So some of the people that worked in the first generation companies have struck out on their own and started their own companies. And in the same vein as SpaceX are trying to really be transformative in opening up access to space. Now, you've got your first launch coming up in a couple of weeks. Talk to us about what we're going to see there and are you ready? Yeah, we're super excited. We've been at this about four years. The Alpha rocket is on the launch pad, ready for its inaugural launch just last week. We had a static fire test where we held the rocket down for 15 seconds and we let it run to make sure all the systems were ready to go and it went flawlessly. So we're really excited about launch on September 2nd. Uh, we're going to let her go and uh, we think we're going to get it to orbit in just a few minutes afterwards. So then talk to us about the vision beyond this. Obviously, this is a whole new economy that's just kicking off. I mean, this is your first launch. Um, you want a critical lunar lander contract from NASA uh, to take 10 payloads to space in 2023. You know, paint the bigger picture, the bigger vision here. Yeah, the bigger picture is space is clearly open for business now. So it's not just about exciting technology, it's about exciting business opportunities. So Firefly, what's unique about us is we're not just a rocket company, we are an end-to-end -end space transportation company, which means we can get you to space on rockets, but then we have other things like our lunar lander program that can allow you to land on other uh, celestial body. So um, in doing that end-to-end -end mission, we expect to capture um, the large parts of the space transportation market in general. So just really exciting time to be involved. And Firefly is really excited about the full spectrum of space transportation offerings that we have. Meantime, Blue Origin and SpaceX are in this argument over their lunar launder, lander and NASA's contract. You know, what's your take on this? And how do these kind of issues impact the momentum in the space? Yeah, momentum is a key word. Momentum's important. You know, we're part of the Artemis program. We're very proud and, uh, to be part of that. And we really want to see things move along as quickly as they can. NASA has been moving the program along very quickly. Um, now in this recent challenge that we've had with this contract, uh, the GAO responded very quickly in, in trying to um, resolve the problem. And so we're just hopeful that uh, in the next stage and if this goes to court, that it will also be resolved very quickly so the whole Artemis program can move forward as briskly as America needed to. And speaking of Blue Origin, we were just down in Van Horn, Texas, covering Jeff Bezos's launch into space. Meantime, we've noticed the number of Blue Origin engineers are actually leaving the company. One just became your COO. Mm -hmm. What's the signal there? What, why is that happening? Uh, um, I, I think there's a lot of movement um, in, within the industry. You know, if you look at me, for example, I was an early SpaceX employee. Um, I was also a Virgin employee. I helped to engineer that, that really cool uh, Launcher 1 rocket that you showed in the video earlier. Um, I also worked at Blue Origin. So there's just a lot of movement around in these second-generation companies. And 
Uh, people are just finding uh, roles where they fit best uh, within these different companies. So I would just say that, you know, we all feel like we're part of a larger new space movement and it's not just about one company. So I think you'll see a lot of movement between the companies, uh, the people that are just, just have that, that mindset. Now, you actually worked at Blue Origin, SpaceX, and Virgin Galactic before starting Firefly. So I'd love to know, how would you compare them as places to work, given that there is such competition for talent? Yeah, they all have their uh, own unique events, and it really has to do with the leadership of the different companies. You know, I think Elon Musk has a slightly different vision than, than Jeff Bezos or Richard Branson has. So that leadership brings um, a different vision for each of those companies. Now, Firefly, what we're setting out to do is, is to really build a company that's as impactful and transformative as SpaceX was. And that's what I set out to do here at Firefly and in the last four years. Uh, we've made a lot of progress along those lines. So what are the biggest milestones coming up in the space race from Firefly or others that you're watching that we should be watching that are going to define the next decades of space travel and exploration? So I think you're just going to see a lot of launches coming out of companies like Virgin Orbit and uh, Relativity uh, and Firefly. Um, so this is going to be the advent of widespread availability of space launch and space access. So that's going to be really exciting to see all these new entrants come into the field. Uh, but other big developments I see is, is SpaceX's Starship. It's just such a huge vehicle, and it can be so transformative in, in moving the large-scale infrastructure that we need to do the most ambitious human exploration program. So uh, I'm personally really excited to see uh, Starship go in the next couple of years. All right, fascinating. Well, we'll make sure to follow that uh, and, and all of those milestones that you mentioned. Tom Markusik, Firefly Aerospace CEO, co-founder and CTO. Tom, thanks so much for joining us. All right, coming up, how does a four-day, 32-hour work week sound to you? After the break, I'm going to speak with a congressman who wants to make that the law. California's Mark Takano with us next. And make sure you stay tuned to Bloomberg Television and Radio all week for our special in-depth coverage of Jackson Hole. The gathering will once again be an all-virtual affair due to concerns over the surge in Delta variant cases. But we can still expect robust conversations around inflation, the tapered timeline, and the ongoing impact of COVID-19. We'll bring you all the action as it happens, including a speech by Fed Chair Jay Powell. Catch that this Friday, 10 a.m. Wall Street time, 7 a.m. right here on the West Coast. This is Bloomberg. The five-day, 40-hour work week is pretty much standard in the United States and has been for, well, decades. But some companies, including Microsoft and Unilever, have been experimenting with cutting that down to four days and 32 hours a week. Congressman Mark Takano of California has introduced a bill that would make the shorter work week the norm. Congressman Takano joins us now from Washington for our weekly work shifting segment. Representative Takano, thank you so much for joining us. So a lot of people, this legislation has started a lot of debate. Why do you think this is so important? Well, I think, um, you know, we just are hopefully coming out of a pandemic that's frankly put a lot of us in uh, a new work environment. Uh, a lot of people have been working uh, from home. Um, it's revolutionized uh, the way people ha work, and people are used to a, a flexibility that they would not have dreamed possible before the pandemic. And uh, as we come out of it, uh, people don't want to go back to the old way of doing things, which was really all not that great, uh, but really are interested in creating something new. Uh, and so I think there's a big openness uh, to the idea of continuing the flexibility that they uh, that many, many workers had uh, when they discovered, uh, uh, you know, working from home. So how much of this has to do with flexibility and how much of this has to do with uh, trying to get people to make livable wages for fewer hours or get them paid more money for the hours they're already working? Well, you know, the, the conversations that are happening, I think, most in earnest about the four-day work week are actually happening uh, in the non-hourly worker uh, environment, uh, the so-called exempt workers, uh, people who don't have to 
that aren't uh, subject to the hourly, uh, the wage and hour, uh, hour and wage laws. So um, uh, the idea is that uh, companies in the tech space, such as, uh, well, Kickstarter, for example, uh, they're looking at a four day, eight hour a day uh, work week with no loss in pay. Uh, they're planning to pay these people the same, um, and they're piloting, uh, the, they're piloting that, that four-day work week. Uh, and one of the things they're going to look at is whether or not the productivity remains the same or actually increases, believe it or not. Uh, some preliminary experiments have been done uh, by Microsoft Japan. Uh, some work has been done in Iceland. They didn't reduce it down to 32 hours, but they reduced it down uh, by two and a half hours. And actually, in Scandinavian countries, they actually work a 37 and a half uh, hour workday. So uh, it's going to be a, a much different conversation for the hourly workers, which my bill covers. Uh, but it's a conversation and a debate that I want to start because uh, we don't. I want to see us look at moving uh, the entire country to a 32-hour work week, not just certain sectors of the workforce. It sounds great for a lot of people, but I'm sure you've got a lot of business leaders out there saying this is going to hurt productivity. What's your response to that? Well, uh, that's particularly why I'm interested in the pilots that are happening uh, in particularly the tech space of uh, where the reduction in the work week to some of these pilots have, have shown that uh, there has been no loss in productivity. And in fact, uh, there's been some benefits that have accrued to actually employers as well. Uh, employers have less overhead if they're open only four days out of the five. Uh, they have a better, more motivated workforce. Uh, they may actually save on some uh, medical claims because workers are less stressed and workers are better able to a attend to their health. Uh, and workers find that they're paying less uh, for childcare because it's uh, you know one day less a week that they're paying for childcare. So there's a lot of ways in which workers and employers can benefit uh, from a reduced work week. Uh, okay. The government of Japan is that actually issued guidelines encouraging uh, employers to move toward the four-day work week. Are there others in Congress who are actively engaging on this with you and actively engaging on the shifting future of work in general? So, say that again. Uh, I, I couldn't hear your question. Are there others in Congress who are actively engaging on this legislation with you and engaging on well, the changing have, future have... of work in general? I do, yes, of course. I mean, uh, I sit on the Education and Labor Committee, uh, led by uh, Chairman Bobby Scott. Um, we've had uh, the whole issue of uh, the changing nature of work, um, how work will change in the future, the role of uh, AI and um, technology. Uh, I've got co-sponsors of the bill. Uh, Jan Schakowsky is one of the uh, co-sponsors, as is uh, Rashida Tlaib. Um, and I suspect as more of my colleagues find out just what a tremendous response this bill is getting and how it's resonating with the public, we'll have more, uh, more folks signing on to the bill. Um, okay. I'm, I'm just sort of, uh, you know, just sort of gratified by the response it's getting. So speaking of shorter hours, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention you should actually be back in California right now, but we're pulled back to Washington so Congress can get to the most pressing issues of the day. Do you see this major infrastructure bill passing this week, and do you think it'll be packaged with the budget bill? Well, um, you know, infrastructure and reconciliation are like love and marriage. They go together. And uh, I expect that they will be voted on together. I'm not clear whether we're going to vote uh, on final passage, uh, uh, well, what I do know is that uh, we can't do final passage of the reconciliation bill until we mark it up. Uh, what I do believe we're going to be voting on uh, today or tomorrow is the uh, the rule of procedure for both bills. Uh, we said we we call it the rule, so we'll pass a rule for for both for both of those measures. Uh, but I don't know that we'll actually act on infrastructure. I don't believe we'll act on infrastructure before finally being ready to pass the reconciliation bill. But I ultimately believe that both are going to pass uh, and both are fairly much intact in what we see now. All right. Well, thank you so much for the status update there. Love and marriage. Love the metaphor. Thank you. Representative Mark Takano will keep following that four-day workweek legislation.
Coming up, fresh details emerging in the lawsuit between Hollywood heavyweight Scarlett Johansson and Disney. We're going to have all the details from LA next. Meantime, Ryan Reynolds' latest comedy, Free Guy, was the top film in the U.S. for the second straight week. It fought off several new challengers, including Paramount's Paw Patrol, the movie. Free Guy is one of the first Disney films in over a year to have a pure theatrical debut. It's generated $28.4 million in sales so far, almost 50% higher than expected. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> It's not so much about Moon and Mars, even though that captures the attention and the billionaires going to space, it's actually about the Earth. These are about, the, these data sets have huge value. The transportation of data enables things like tele-education, telemedicine, the creation of new data sets like our own a planet uh, is the enablement of things like efficient and sustainable agriculture practices. That was Will Marshall, CEO of the satellite imaging company Planet, talking to us on Bloomberg Technology last week about the importance of data. And while the U.S. Department of Agriculture shares his thoughts, it's just tapped Planet to integrate its high-resolution satellite data into helping the government agency better access crops for this year's growing season. Planet, which was founded in 2010 by three NASA scientists, also provides data to more than 600 clients and other government agencies. Now, for another story on combating the effects of climate change, furniture giant IKEA will offer renewable energy to Swedish households as it further diversifies its business. Take a look at this. The uh, electricity subscriptions uh it's a part of this new business area that we have called the clean energy services. So the purpose for this new business area is to contribute and to create this biggest movement uh, in the world for renewable energy. We will add even more products. We have uh, solar panels that we sell, and now we have the, uh, soon I should say, the electricity subscription. So it really fits that ambition that we have to within the frame of life at home, the most important place in the world, we can add uh, more value to our customers uh, to live more sustainably. And this is uh, a big part of the, uh, the climate positive uh, strategy that IKEA has for 2030, that we will uh, remove and reduce climate emissions uh, more than we emit in our entire uh, value chain. IKEA's Jonas Carlhead there, really interesting. Meantime, details continuing to emerge in the lawsuit between Scarlett Johansson and Disney. The Hollywood actress suing the movie studio over claims she was cheated out of potential earnings when her latest film, Black Widow, was released simultaneously in theaters and online. Court filings now show Disney has taken a in $125 million in online sales alone. For more on this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Chris Palmieri in L.A. So what does that number, Chris, $125 million actually signify? Uh, is that a lot? And what does that mean for Scarlett Johansson's case? Yeah, just to, so to put that in context, um, first of all, the, the studios are not generally saying a lot about how much uh, money they're really getting in these online purchases. And just to, to recap, Black Widow came out in theaters and online for an additional $30 uh, on the same day. And initially, and it was a surprise, Disney said in the opening weekend it had taken in $60 million. And so now with this new number, uh, it's you know, more than twice that. And so for people who want to know just how big a deal this uh, online purchases can be and are, uh, this, you know, puts a number roughly, you know, 4 million people bought it. 
So Disney's also filing and asking this case to be sent to arbitration rather than being litigated in public. Scarlett Johansson's lawyers are saying, why do they want this to be litigated out of the public eye and made the accusation they're trying to juice Disney Plus subscriptions? What do you make of that argument? Well, uh, almost certainly, um, you know, they, they are trying to increase Disney Plus subscriptions with this strategy, but it's, you know, a strategy, you know, born of the pandemic and, and, and not a lot of people are willing to go into theaters. And uh, so the studios are all in this chicken and egg situation. Uh, nobody's going to go to theaters if there's not really good movies to see. And uh, at the same time, if they put out a really good movie in the you know, midst of surge like this of the, the COVID uh, you know, it, it's going to be difficult to, to make a lot of money off this. Yes, of course, there, Disney does want to keep this under wraps and not have a highly public trial. And, in fact, there is arbitration clauses in, in uh, Scarlett Johansson's agreement. And um, it seems her lawyers deliberately sort of sued the parent company rather than Marvel, which was the studio that signed her agreement, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an attempt to get this case uh, public rather than in uh, you know, a more private setting. Interesting. Well, we're certainly going to continue to follow the twists and turns of that one. Chris Palmieri, thanks so much for bringing us that update. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Join me tomorrow. We're going to preview this week's earnings from cloud services uh, with companies and the former VMware co-COO Sanjay Poonin will be with us. We're also going to talk to the CEO of Ginkgo Bioworks, Jason Kelly, and Eurasia Group senior analyst Xiaomeng Lu. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.